why navigate post your server call? So if you're looking to increase your accuracy, if you're um, wanting to confirm screw positioning, if you're uh, trying to clarify complex anatomy, especially uh, cervical pedicle screws, um, uh, navigation is certainly um, appropriate. Um, what I found, um, so uh, like uh, Dr. Polly, um, I started definitely later with the use of navigation, but um, uh, cervical spine takes on a different animal um, in, uh, compared to TL spine. You know, you get good at TL spine, but everything needs to be redefined and refined, and that's what we'll get to uh, today in the talk of cervical navigation. From room setup, from simply room setup to patient positioning, to the placement of your navigation array and which one you actually end up choosing, um, the type of exposure, the instruments you use, and the overall plan of how you put the screws in before the decompression, all that, all those kind of, uh, of aspects need to be reworked and refined if you're going to do cervical. Because you can't just take a deformity workflow, apply it to cervical, and expect it to work. Um, in the literature, uh, we know the accuracy, we know the uh, cl uh, clinical uh, rates of revision with TL. In the cervical, um, uh, this was an earlier study looking at some of the C2 pedicle screws, but certainly um, uh, Shane Birch with his accuracy of um, O-arm cervical has uh, led to a lot of uh, new studies, uh, 2017, uh, looking at C12 posterior uh, cervical, cervical fixation associated with more clinical issues like reduced blood loss, length of stay, um, complications. This is a JBJS British uh, from 2017. Once again, talking about uh, pedicle screws in the cervical and upper thoracic. So this is definitely becoming more mainstream uh, in the literature. Um, if Roger Hartle was here, I'd uh, give him a shout out, but uh, he couldn't make it today. Um, but again, his uh, cervical pedicle screw um, uh, study meta-analysis uh, shows that statistically uh, navigation is superior to fluoro. But this, these are real cases um, of examples of navigated fluoro in the beginning. Um, and what you see is that there's either a fit on that le uh, image on the uh, right, um, there's a little bit of a phase shift um, where uh, we certainly didn't get the pedicle at all. Um, and then on the left, another type of error where the depth, and I think Dave has kind of reported on, Dave Polly has reported on that too, the accuracy of depth uh, in regards to uh, screws. So this one went a little long. Um, and so you have to exercise a very amount, uh, high amount of caution. Uh, it is a mobile spine. We're finding that that deflection um, of the spine that we saw in columbar that we warn people about is becoming even more amplified in the cervical spine and there's a steep learning curve with little room for error. In the beginning, um, we did cervical navigations the way we always did it. Chest bolster, Skytron table, Mayfield frame. Um, uh, now, uh, what we're using more is a Jackson table. And what we do with the Jackson table with the Mayfield frame attachment is we put that chest pad way high up, almost to the point uh, where it's on the clavicles, uh, very f uh, not too far away from the chin. The chin is literally almost touching that um, upper chest pad of the Jackson table. That stabilizes the cervical thoracic junction and then the obvious Mayfield uh, stabilizes the occipital cervical junction and so you have a relatively rigid um, area. Um, we don't use these long extended bow, um, uh, uh, Mayfield frames. Um, as you can see they drop down a little bit. That blocks the O-arm once it's closed from rising up and so you stay away from that for cervical. It doesn't matter with thoracolumbar but in cervical these little details uh, about patient positioning need to be paid attention attention to. And the workflow remains the same. Um, everybody, uh, the patient is draped. Uh, we don't use the plastic drape. Um, everybody walks out um, uh, before the spin is obtained. Uh, we hold uh, respiration. Um, and uh, essentially, this is the uh, spin occurring um, in uh, at Cedar. So everyone is completely out for that brief moment. And then when the spin is done, you look around and there's no one around you. Everybody is gone. <laughs> and so you have to try to find them, pull them back in. Very frustrating. Um, so uh, when we look at reference frames, remember in the TL spine, I said use what you want. Uh, anything is uh, your choice. In the cervical spine, we started out with these spinous process um, uh, uh, clamps, but we found that they weren't quite um, giving us the accuracy. There was a lot of uh, multi-level failures that were phase shift with these. So we started using these, uh, the articulated uh, Mayfield uh, arm um, that attaches to the outside of the Mayfield frame. So your um, 
OR attachment frame attaches on the inside and the articulated arm attaches outside. Um, and uh, we place that right at close to the base of the ox occiput, um, as close to the cervical region of interest as we can without blocking your elbow and arm. So we do a lot of um, uh, pre-operative or pre-intraoperative pre-incision um, judgment um, to place this in it. We spend a lot of time doing that because if you get it right, it won't bother you for the rest of the case. But if you mess it up constantly, you'll be like, gosh darn Mayfield arm thing. You try to, it just becomes a big cluster. Um, the, uh, so we said that uh, the, this uh, Mayfield frame is probably the ideal one. Um, the camera could be is usually placed at the head of the bed, and so therefore the line of sight issue is completely unobstructed. So if your S7 Trion camera is here and it's looking at your um, reference uh, frame here and your instrument's distal to it, um, there, nothing gets in the way. And so we rarely, outside of the anesthesiologist's head that pops up uh, and blocks our um, line of sight issue, otherwise um, we have a clear view and that seems to be extremely efficient uh, for workflow. I went into the general considerations, specific considerations for navigation cervical um, due to the high mobility. Remember the table positioning and the self-retaining retractors and the breathing. Um, those are key um, in the cervical spine, if not even more amped up. We literally are uh, extremely uh, careful about that. We drill all pilot screws before any type of instrumentation or tapping has occurred. Uh, we paint all our holes um, before we start. Um, and we start again just like TL spine, but there's no um, unstable fragment. We start with the distal screws. Usually, if we're doing a big uh, C2 to C7 or uh, a fusion, uh, we start with the distal C7, C6 pedicle screws, and we march our way back up to the reference frame. Because as we know, accuracy, accuracy degrades with time and distance. Um, so as we take each um, portion of the spine, uh, cervical spine in detail, um, C1 lateral masses, they used to be um, extremely harrowing for me because um, uh, our institution, my residency never did any of those. Um, you come in and you um, uh, use navigation. And one of the things that you learn with navigation is that um, there's the traditional way, which is drill the posterior portion of the C1 arch, identify the facet joint, go middle and slightly medial. And there's all these trajectories, right? Standardized, medialized, parallel, anterior tubercle. This is the traditional way. Um, but with navigation, one of the things you realize is that in the right patient, if they have a nice posterior arch, you can literally drill through bone all the way into the lateral um, mass without violating the, um, the, the uh, artery above or the nerve below. You don't have to worry about these partially threaded screws. You can go inside the bone. And so this is an example of uh, the traditional screw, C1 lateral mass, but you can argue that in the right patient, they're usually younger. Um, uh, older patients have a very thin posterior arch, but in uh, younger patients, you get a very thick posterior C1 ring. You can phase shift that screw one uh, about two, two millimeters higher and just go straight through and through. And so that's the kind of beauty of navigation is you can have fun with it. You can literally sky the posterior inferior arch uh, and go straight into the C1 with just a barely putting a pen field just to identify where the C2 nerve root is. But usually the C2 nerve root is not even um, an issue anymore. Um, and so, uh, and then you get um, uh, cute with reverse trajectories. You can measure your screw length. Um, but ideally, the deep bony anatomy makes these C1 um, screws uh, relatively straight. Straightforward. For C2, in my hands, uh, C2 is uh, definitely the most fun um, because it's kind of like a Cracker Jack box. You never know what you're going to get. Um, sometimes patients' anatomies, the pedicles are extremely atretic, um, and so you have to put PAR screws in. Sometimes they've had C2 uh, pedicle screw attempts, so then you have to do a transarticular. I've done translaminar, um, you know, all these different uh, screw trajectories, and they are literally just pointing the reference frame, trying to find the best bony channel in relation to the overall overall cadence of your instrumentation. So if you're going to, if you have um, someone who's, uh, who has no um, pedicle, then you look for, is a translaminar going to screw, is my screw tulip from my translaminar screw going to mate my occipital uh, cervical rod the best? Or is it going to be a par screw or is it going to be something else? And that's kind of the fun part of C2 screws now. 
which uh, normally they never were. They were a lot more scary. Uh, Dr. Johnson talks about uh, exposing the medial uh, portion of the pedicle and seeing a, um, the toilet bowl, um, which I never understood. I still don't understand what that means, um, but um, uh, I don't. <laughs> um, but uh, it just navigation makes that a lot easier. And so when you look at this, um, this is a, um, a great kind of C2 pedicle, uh, nice and thick. The trajectory is right there and um, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, let's see. And then um, obviously uh, the uh, transarticular, translaminar, uh, I don't do a lot of them, but um, certainly for revision purposes, uh, this is uh, navigation makes it extremely easy. So then let's get into the talk of uh, the other portion of the lateral masses. Lateral masses, one level, um, I have to say I am guilty. I've used it uh, for ACDFs that develop a non-union where I go posteriorly, where a lot is on the line. They're pretty upset that the anterior didn't work. What I don't want is a screw into uh, the nerve, uh, nerve foramen. Um, I've done it once or twice, low dose setting, small patient, trying to draw down that radiation as much as possible. But in the case of, just like I said, in ank spondies where you're putting in 12 screws, in a occiput to T3 or a large construct, this lateral mass is literally, these lateral mass screws sequentially um, it can be extremely efficient and quick. You're literally, literally painting dots on one, we, and then you drill, followed by uh, filling in 12, 14, or 16 bicortical screws, whatever your choice may be. But it has literally uh, changed the, um, the overall workflow and timing. And so um, certainly uh, where you wouldn't think of it uh, for a one or two level, it becomes extremely effective if you're uh, doing a multi-cervical, uh, multi-level. And then finally, these pedicle screws. Uh, for the life of me, I still can't find a patient where I can put in a reliable C3 pedicle screw. I just can't. <laughs> I've looked and looked. Um, where they become very common, though, is at C7, C6, occasionally C5. Um, and again, also the problem I have is lining that up with the rest of my rod construct. Um, but C6, 7, we, that it tends to be our workhorse. And they that really acts sometimes as the uh, pelvic bolts um, down in the, in the cervical spine, the analog to the lumbar. Um, so if you can get nice one, nice um, uh, pedicle screws at your distal fixation, uh, then potentially you can avoid extending it into the thoracic. Um, uh, <clears throat> we uh, definitely employ it for um, if the patient's anatomy is permissible, revision strategy, um, and the trajectory is variable. And as I said, for cervical thoracic junction, it's ideal. So here's our, um, uh, to kind of wrap things all up together, here's a uh, patient of uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, they uh, had surgery done uh, decades ago. It was um, um, pr probably one of the first generation navigations they used, a C2 to C7. And in this uh, lady um, who was 60, uh, 66, I believe, um, a traumatic fracture, but not uh, life uh, threatening. So heard a snap um, after one of her many falls and then slowly but progressively presented with an extreme chin on chest. I mean, her head was literally facing down to her uh, feet. So um, what we identify clearly is the subjacent um, uh, fracture, fatigue, uh, kyphotic uh, degeneration, similar to the uh, cervical uh, uh, patient I presented earlier. Um, and if you look at the um, uh, sagittal uh, CT scan, um, what you identify is that um, there's solid fusion um, uh, from previous, from C2 all the way down to C7. This is a left uh, C7 pedicle. Um, and um, uh, this is the uh, fracture and the, uh, the gradual degeneration deformation at the CT junction. Um, and mind you, um, to go from this CT scan from initial presentation where she's staring at her feet, um, uh, we placed her in traction uh, in the ICU for about a week. Uh, and we gradually took blanket after blanket off uh, day by day until we eventually got to a point where she was reasonable. Because you can't operate on someone whose chin is on their chest. There's no access. Um, and so this was her CT scan after a week. And you can see that generally there's good correction. We were able to get it somewhat less kyphotic uh, than initial. Um, this is the pedicle on the other side. Um, Uh, and what you see here is that um, that screw kind of ripped out of the C7 pedicle. 
Um, and that's the C7 pedicle right there. So uh, not ideal, uh, very difficult CT junction, osteoporotic woman, uh, navigation is, is key. And so uh, the fun part of this is it was an anterior posterior, an anterior where we debride out all that fibrous non-union fracture fragments and we put a nice tricortical iliac crest wedge in the front. And then in the back, we basically just fill the spine, bone, wherever we can find instrumentation points. Whether it's through the same holes, we tried some pedicle screws at various levels, and ultimately then uh, extended it down to T3, and uh, what you get is a nice uh, re restoration um, from a previous uh, um, um, patient. And uh, overall, um, uh, navigate <coughs> this case, whereas in the beginning would have uh, made me uh, lose many sleepless nights, becomes uh, quite um, fun and uh, uh, one that's uh, very achievable. Thank you very much.